Hello and welcome to our Therapyology Thursday. I'm Brooke Bendix, founder of Therapyology and clinical therapist. I'm here with Brooke Weingarten, Dr. Weingarten, psychiatrist. Brooke, Dr. Weingarten, <laughs> um, can you tell us a little bit of, about yourself? Sure. Um, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work out of the Birmingham Maple Clinic in Troy. Um, I see kids, mostly some young adults, a um, wide range of things ranging from anxiety, depression, ADHD, behavioral issues, genetic issues, um, all kinds of stuff. I went to med school in Florida and came back home for residency and fellowship and all that. Yep. How long have you been practicing? I think it's been about 10 years. Yeah. I think I started private practice like a little bit after mm -hmm. you started. And that's how we began mm -hmm. our professional relationship and working together. And throughout all of that, we've seen, you know, this fluff, this um, evolution of mental health and psychiatry and what that's, what has happened over the last decade and more recently in the last three years since this pandemic mm -hmm. but what trends have you seen in your line of work especially with psychiatry and mental health with kids and teens that you work with over the course of like the last decade of practice so over the last decade in general i think that people are much more open-minded people are talking about mental health more which is huge mm -hmm. um people are more willing to acknowledge it and look into treatment and sort of gaining a little more insight into what, you know, why people are feeling and acting the way that they are. Um, so I think that's huge, especially over the last few years, you know, with the pandemic and all of the changes with, you know, online schooling and in person and, and all the different changes that everyone's been through. There's definitely been a spike in the needs of mental health, which has been wonderful because there's telemedicine now, which has increased access for care. Because access to care is so much greater, there's now a need for more people because it's very hard to get in anywhere. Huge but, high demand, yeah, especially high demand. for pediatrics, mm -hmm. which is what you kind of specialize in as well. And right. you know, I know throughout the last couple of years, your wait list has grown and grown, and it's it's become a huge problem throughout the entire country of finding adequate mm -hmm. care really absolutely that has been like a huge huge problem therapists right. psychiatrists right. everyone um you know a lot more anxiety depression adhd behavioral issues yeah. i think even just social emotional growth that normally would have happened at certain times we've definitely seen that stunted right um just because of those like three years where everything kind of stood still yeah. and we're definitely seeing the after effects of that. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So over the last decade, I know that, you know, especially working with pediatrics, you see a lot of kids and teens who have summer plans and mm -hmm. vacations and things, you know, of that nature during the summertime, they go away. I know I myself, would go away for a month to overnight camp in the summer. But when school ends, what do you see in terms of trends, potentially, as we call, we coin this the medication vacation or the therapy vacation? Because all of a sudden, and it's usually not only with kids, too. Right. It's, we see it in adults as well. It's like, all of a sudden, it's summertime, and you're like, feeling good. Oh, medication? Right. Oh, therapy? What what trends, what do you typically see and how do you respond to those uh, mentalities that during the summertime is a time where they take a vacation from their medication or their therapy? So, yes, <laughs> for a all lot of, of reasons, all of it, <laughs> um, for a lot of reasons, people do feel that way. And sometimes it's all, you know, we all kind of get into that situation where it's like, school's out for the summer, turning my brain off, right. whatever that means. I don't want to even think or do anything. Yeah. And so for some people, I can appreciate that they just want to take a break and everybody deserves a break. Right. Um, there certainly are kids that are just so busy. They have camps and they have sports and they have all kinds of different activities. So it, certainly it is hard sometimes to fit in appointments and therapy and all that kind of stuff. Um, for some kids, um, 
their stress level has changed and so they're feeling better in the summertime. Um, that being said, I think that there are some times where it's kind of okay to do a break. Um, like if somebody has been doing really well for an extended period of time and you right. want to kind of check in and see where things are, you know, do you still need the treatment? Do you want to kind of play around with doses? Do, you know, is this still something that's indicated? Right. That's totally reasonable. But I also think that, you know, it, it takes a while for a lot of these medicines to build up in the system. And so if you stop yeah. them right over the summer and then you decide to start them up again in the fall, then that's not really the fall. It sort of takes another month or so to build up. Right. Um, and so that could be a challenge. But also, I mean, kids are home or at camp and somebody's with them and yeah. somebody, you know, if we're talking anxiety, social anxiety, um, depression, interactions with peers, mm -hmm. that's a big thing that's still happening in the summer yeah. um, when you're looking at ADHD, because I think that's one of the bigger ones where people like to take breaks. But, yeah. Um, right. You know, yes, we're not looking at academics, but we're looking at, again, the social dynamics, behavior, um, behavior yeah. mm -hmm. um, making good choices. Like if you're at summer camp and you are not making good choices. If you are in, interacting inappropriately with the other kids, that's going to make or break your experience and the way that you make connections with other people. So that's important. Right. Um, right. I kind of tell people, yeah. you know, some people have glasses and they wear them all the time. Some people have glasses where they wear them to see the, the board or when they're driving for certain reasons. But whether or not you wear them, that's still your prescription. And yep. you certainly would do a lot better if they were on. And kind of feel the same way about medications, unless there's a particular reason why they need to be off of it. Right. I think just because it's sunny out and the weather is nicer or school is not in session doesn't mean the problems go away. Right. And I think that that's a big thing that a lot of our clientele and parents when when it starts becoming nicer or they say well you know it's summertime so the problems all went away I'm like, did they go away or are they masked because it's 80 degrees and sunny right. and they're they don't have tests and there's you know school isn't in mm -hmm. session and they don't have those daily stressors academic but the the base problems the depression the the inability to focus they're still there but maybe they're being transferred elsewhere. Like right. I'm, you know, I go to a camp during the summer and I see all of these same issues and problems we see during the school mm -hmm. year in school, inability to focus, um, social issues, social anxiety, uh, attachment issues. They're all just being placed in a different location at camp. Right. So I think, you know, yes, it depends on who who the kid or the teen is and what they're dealing with. But, you know, this idea that sometimes taking a break during this time of the year can, can be beneficial, but it also can be detrimental because of waiting until August mm -hmm. when, when, you know, things start to get busy again and there's potentially no availability you know, the psychiatry appointments are all booked up mm -hmm. or they need to restart on a medication that takes some time to right. adjust to. And then we see all, you know, chaos come August and September. Right, right. We're all frantically like, ah. mm -hmm. you know, like, well, what happened in June and July? Exactly. <laughs> right? And I, I totally agree with that because I think, you know, summer is a different, you know, yes, there's not schoolwork, but it's right. a different time of growth. And, you know, especially at camp, like we're learning kids in general. I mean, I went to yeah. camp too, mm -hmm. are learning about how to become independent and responsible and how to problem solve and yeah. interact with people. And this one's not being nice, or this one is doing this and how to figure those things out. Right. And you kind of need your executive functioning to be mm -hmm. on point in order to do that. And I think that that's like a really big time for growth and maturity. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of people want to take a break because, you know, they feel like they're not supposed to be on something. They feel like, you know, I'm, I'm putting, I'm giving my child medication and, and if the, like, the less that I can give them, I'm sure that's better. But, you know, it's really not. But if you're a diabetic. Right. Do you take a break? 
from insulin? Do you take a break from your your diabetes medication? Well, some people do, but you shouldn't. shouldn't. But you shouldn't, you shouldn't, right? Like, if you have a medical mm-hmm. disorder issue, um, you, you treat it. Right. Like, you continuously are treating it. So why should mental health be any different? Exactly. I mean, it's, it's the brain. It's mm-hmm. still a, an organ. And so I think it's just as important as any other medical mm-hmm. issue that you should treat properly. Right. Right. I mean, you know, certainly there's people that come in and they're having – and a depressive episode secondary to a particular event and you right. treated the situation and it's moved on. Like you have strep throat, you treat the course, you know, that is needed and, right. and you move on. And there are those situations. But if you have something that's more genetic or biological or something that's a little bit more chronic that you certainly are seeing that the course of treatment is not finished, yeah. you know, it's definitely recommended to continue it. Um, just like you would any other kind of situation. It's it's neurological. I always pull out my brain and like I have a brain model in my office. And I say, you know, this is your temporal lobe. This is your frontal lobe. And this right. is what's affected when, when you have anxiety. It's on this side. When you're having, you know, trouble with behavior and impulses, it's, it's here in the frontal lobe. Yeah. And like sort of putting it more into like this is an organ system that we have to be balancing. Yeah. Um, I think that's important. I mean, yes, if you, you know, some of the medicines have side effects, some of the medicines can sometimes decrease appetite. And, and those are situations where, you know, if your child is home with you and you can handle it and you can provide some structured environment and structured play and activity and routine, and you need your child to catch up with their eating during that time for medical management i can appreciate that yeah certainly i wouldn't send them to camp for that because then that's someone else's problem and that's not fair right. and doesn't mean they're going to eat when they're there either yeah. yeah um but i can see that that would be one reason why somebody may take a break here and there yeah but yeah. what what would you say to a parent or a teen who without your knowledge decides to go off of their medication regimen cold turkey and without anybody knowing um you know i i see it in practice Mm -hmm. quite often i'm sure you do as well and i always advise to refer to their treating physician psychiatrist Mm -hmm. but we see it quite quite often because it's like I'm not going to take it anymore. Right. You know, so they go to that extreme for whatever their reason is. And, you know, I'm always saying, okay, you need to speak with your your treating psychiatrist or physician first. So, I mean, here's the thing. And I tell, I see this all the time too. And I tell my patients, I'm like, first and foremost... I'm not going to yell at you. God, I'm no judgment here. No, there's no judgment. <laughs> if there's a reason that you feel that you need to or want to go off of something, like let's talk about it. Right. Um, mostly because if it's a good idea, great, let's do that together. If it's not the right idea, like let's talk about why. Yeah. But if you go off of your medicine cold turkey, you know, you might feel really icky. And a lot of times there's withdrawal and there's other side effects, and people don't always anticipate that. And then they get upset that they feel bad and they associate that with the medicine. And it's really, you know, there's safe and, you know, much better ways of going off of medications if that's something you really want. You know, if if that's something that we both discuss and and want to do, I'm happy to help with that. But, you know, we'll talk about it. But I think more psychoeducation and education around the communication with your psychiatrist. And because we see a lot of minors... And their parents or guardians sometimes dictate when their appointments are. Right. And, you know, as we work with many clients uh, and, sh- and refer to each other quite often is that I always tell my teenagers, say, you know, if you want to speak to Dr. Weingarten or your psychiatrist, reach out, send an yeah. email, send a text. Sure. And, you know, it's better to have that communication. Mm-hmm. Um, we know how busy you are and all of us are. But I'd rather them communicate and say this medication's not working or I want to take a break and and be able to do it together Mm -hmm. with support as opposed to ghosting. Right, (laughs) right. And then they'll come back several months later and be like, everything's a disaster. I feel terrible and I don't know why, what's going on. Well, let's take it back this year and we can talk about this. Um, Yeah, absolutely. The parents may be responsible for the appointments, but... um, 
You can call. Right. You can email. You can reach out. Um, even the little ones. If you have a question, it's your it's your body. It's your health. You know, I'm right. I'm here to talk to you too. I'm, you know, and if you need help having your parents set up an appointment, we can we can do that too. We can call them to arrange a time. Right. And and we do that here with our work and as therapists too. Mm -hmm. We say, you know, let's talk about summer scheduling. Right. Are you going away? And now with, you know, when you mentioned telehealth, mm -hmm. that has increased accessibility. So awesome. we can absolutely have sessions while kids are at camp. Right. And although they may not need the frequency that they mm -hmm. normally have, like on a weekly basis, but there's we something that comes up. Check-ins sure. and, you know, every other week. But we can increase that throughout the summer when they start to head back to school, mm -hmm. whereas we don't have a three-month hiatus and three-month break where right. they've lost a lot of the progress that we have been working on. Right. Yeah. And if it's a time that you're feeling good, that's often right. a really amazing time to be working on things because you're not in crisis and you're not right. having to like put fires out here and there. You can actually enjoy the weather, enjoy yeah. a little bit of that, you know, vitamin D that's that's bringing us a little right. happiness and work on some of the, the more deep rooted things so that you're more prepared yeah. and anticipating the things that could be coming. Um, I mean, I, think I always talk awesome. about the summertime because we don't have school to really worry about and the academics and the stressors of after school activities mm -hmm. and sports. But summertime is a really great time to work on your self-esteem and yourself mm -hmm. and a lot of the things that you want to improve in therapy. But there's such, there's this idea and, and uh, notion with during the summer and vacation and medication, uh, vacation and summertime and medication where like you should be feeling good so you don't really need mm -hmm. any of that but it's really the best time for stability and to work on yourself and I think that sort of perceived pressure of you must feel good in the summer is really hard for people that struggle right. from persistent depressive disorder or depressed you know anyone that's right. having any kind of trigger or, or or trauma or anything because then they're feeling terrible but they feel like they're supposed to be feeling good and yeah. then they're really not understanding why or what you know not everybody feels great in the summer right either i think that's even you know a huge point where those who assume and feel like they should be feeling mm -hmm. better in the summer because oh maybe it's a seasonal affective disorder right. Right. You know, we're in the Midwest. And, and while, it's always... yes, that is a type of depression, right. it's not everybody's experience. Right. So even when the weather is great or school is not in session, why am I not feeling better? Right. You know, that's a, a chronic thing that we see and hear from many of our kiddos and teens. And, and for some that don't have that routine and structure, right. you know, they're totally off the chain and everything feels completely you know, unraveled. And while they don't love having tests and they don't love having boring classes right. and whatever, they certainly feel safer and more stabilized when there's a school regimen and a right. yearly regimen. Yeah. How, how do you feel social media has taken <laughs> a, a toll on your clientele in the, the people that you treat? Um, I really, I mean, it's hard growing up as an adolescent. It's hard to be a teen. It's it's so hard. And I don't envy anyone going through it. I I you know, we were yeah, we were teens. Yeah, we were right, adolescents. Right. We remember yeah. and it was so so hard. But it's like a hundredfold now. Yeah. And I think with social media and with so much access to what everybody's doing all the time, I know as an adult that can be challenging and it's so much more challenging for kids that have much higher sensitivity to right. things going on and they don't have a fully developed brain and conceptualization of everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you want to have plans with your friends, you have plans with your friends, but then if you see what everybody else is doing, then everybody feels bad, even if that was not their activity of choice or what they would have even cared about at all. Right. One thing that I hear frequently is the maybe on social media or with our clientele is sometimes you know now that 
mental health is much more widely discussed and the stigma is a lot less than it was a decade ago. Mm -hmm. But many teens kind of discussing specific medications or regimens that they, you know, share with each other and will say, whether it's on social media Mm -hmm. or directly, it's like, well, my friend was on Zoloft and that worked for her or him. So I want to be on that. Right. And, and sometimes, you know, there's, there's positives, positives and negatives mm-hmm. to that. Obviously, if, like, kids are talking about it, it normalizes the fact that people take medicines. It normalizes therapy. It normalizes a lot of that. And sometimes it brings up a good opportunity to say, you know, my friend takes Oloft and, and I want to take that. But then we can have a discussion of why, okay, that's a great idea or right. that's not right for you. Right. And this is why. Right. Um, so that's okay. But then we also see, like, on TikTok and stuff where – People who have absolutely no medical degree and maybe their own personal experience are yeah. saying, I have this diagnosis because of X, Y, and Z, and let's talk about why all of you probably have that too. Right. And it's totally not, you know, like everybody sometimes has a little bit of some of these different things because it's a spectrum and it's all about functionality and how much it's affecting things. Right. But it doesn't mean that everyone's on the spectrum and that everyone's ADHD and that everyone is, anxi- like we don't. Um, and so certainly there's a difference between experiencing some, you know, diagnosis and then explaining it to people versus studying for 12 years and then understanding who and what and where and why that's somebody that has that. I like the fact that it's bringing more awareness Mm -hmm. to psychiatry, to mental health, to medications. It's destigmatizing all of it, but also maybe so much so to the point where, you know, I've had teens say to me that depression is cool, right? (laughs) You know, the, the uh, era and what it's like. And even way back when we were in high school, there was definitely grunge and right, that right. mentality. So that, that piece is you not know? new, right? but it almost seems to be more of a fad. I just aged, aged ourselves. I know. I'm not <laughs> thinking like Kurt Cobain and like we've that's seen so right. much of this is not new. No. Having, you know, artists with mental illness, like we know that's yeah. there, but, and there certainly was, you know, grunge and emo and yeah. all the different things where people are feeling angsty and depressed and, and yes, that's, that's been there, but it does seem more of a fad for lots of different types of groups. Right. And that's sort of a dangerous fad to have. And yeah. while it's great for people to be open and supportive of each other, it's also super triggering for people that really are struggling with those things. Yep. And, you know, we don't, you know, just because everybody's got it doesn't mean you need to, or you want to, or you shouldn't be addressing it to make it go away just because you still want to be the same as everybody else. Right. Yeah, I agree. So what would you say to a parent or a teen potentially as we head into the summer months now that are questioning or asking for uh, psychiatric advice um, for how to manage this summer? you know, whether it's taking a break or what do you, what do you say to those parents or teens that are looking for advice as to how to approach this over the summer? So, I mean, if there's any question, if you're wondering, if you don't know what the right thing to do is, I mean, talk to your doctor, talk to your pediatrician, talk to your psychiatrist. You know, if you are wondering who the right one to talk to, talk to your Mm -hmm. therapist. Um, that's always step one. Um, Generally, I'm going to recommend staying on medication unless there's a particular reason not to. Yeah. Um, but again, if there's question, talk to your doctor. I think making sure that they're, you know, it's not good to sit home all day, every day and just do nothing. Right. You know, having structured activities is going to be really helpful. Sometimes, you know, yeah, school's out, take a day or two and do nothing. That's wonderful. Yeah. You know, the longer you do that, you sink into the the couch and then you do see more of that depression. Right. Um and those with ADHD and any kind of behavioral um, issues, you're going to see an exacerbation in those um, in those behaviors right. too. So structure and routine, even if it's fun structure, is good. You know, visual schedules, those things are great to have. Yeah. Um, and really sticking with your routine. Like if you were on blood pressure medicine the whole mm-hmm. year round and then you're like, oh, it's summer, I'm going to go off of that. And I'm going to just also like not do any of my lifestyle right. changes or exercise or eating well. That'll be great. You're probably going to feel pretty terrible. Right. Yeah. And also that's scary. And it's similar scary, yeah. you know, with this kind of stuff. Yeah. 
we say the same thing. We say, check in with your therapist, make sure that, you know, you have a couple of appointments scheduled, even if they're Mm check-ins or the frequency is less, maybe every two or three weeks so that we're not going from June, July, August, and then we're not meeting again until September Mm -hmm. and all the problems and things that you are, have been dealing with have just been a bandaid has put been put on right. and they're they're still there but now we've lost traction we've lost some progress mm-hmm. and it takes a little bit of time to build that back up so you know whether it's medication or therapy it's you know it should be as we kind of say all year round right. but the frequency of it can always shift and change absolutely yeah i mean i've certainly had people that have been super stable and doing well for a long time and then they'll go to a, a less frequency with their therapist mm-hmm. or they move to like once a month and they'll come back to me the next month and they'll say you know i don't think i'm doing that great and i'm like well when's the last time you were in therapy oh it's kind of been a while oh i guess that was kind of supportive yeah. i guess how do you know <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that even without realizing it, there's something about that consistency and I know it's hard and I know it's hard to fit things in and, yeah. you know, but it's, there's a reason we do it. It's, we, yeah. we're not just doing this for for our fun. It's, right. We know that it's yeah. evidence-based. It's helpful. It's, yep. There's yeah. reasons that we recommend that. Yeah. Well, I, for one, am happy that there, you know, has been more of these, this destigmatization of mental health and psychiatry and medication Mm -hmm. for the younger generation, because we see so many kids and teens here at Therapyology that, you know, we have so many of them coming in and saying, I'm the one who requested a therapist. I wanted to go to therapy. It's not my parents kind of pushing me. Mm -hmm. I know that 10 kids in my class also have a therapist. So I want my own. So things are really leaning towards and shifting in a more positive direction for um, accessibility and destigmatization. There is that demand. And that I think is the biggest right. and hardest, most difficult thing is once they're finally saying, I'd like right. to help finding right. somebody that has availability. Who's a child so... therapist or a child psychiatrist mm-hmm. sometimes feels like it's a needle in a haystack. That, right. And you know, I think that's where we as mental health and medical professionals continue to try and push the needle and and really advocate for our clientele and our Mm -hmm. patients that we're working towards you know bringing more people into the field and increasing that um, accessibility and more therapists and psychiatrists in the field so that Mm -hmm. we can have uh, more treatment and more help for those who need it absolutely you know absolutely and I think it's good, at least for those that are saying, I, I would like to talk to someone, like that's right. the best case scenario yeah. versus people that will come to me and say, I have this diagnosis and these symptoms and all these things, Um, you know, you're, do you know what that means? Tell right. me what that means to you, because right. that may not at all be the same thing, but, you know, we're hearing a lot of these things and it's a great way to get the conversation started as long as you're talking to the right people right. to get the information Right. I mean, we've learned all this stuff about misinformation and that's been a really big theme Mm -hmm. lately. And I think that that applies here just as much. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you feel that there are things that are going on, at least make sure that you're going to the right sources to get that information. Right. Absolutely. Well, Brooke, this is the Brooke and Brooke show. We're (laughs) taking over. Uh, Dr. Weingarten, thank you so much for your time and talking to us and giving us some information and advice because as we head into summer I know a lot of parents and kids and teens are curious and wanting mm-hmm. to know a little bit about how they approach these topics and issues and they and think all camps will yep. dispense medication yep. they have a whole system they will you know they I yep it. absolutely they make it very easy they do as well as for therapy as well mm-hmm. so yes well thank you so much for thank your you time and joining time. us uh, today on Therapyology Thursday Later.